Tonight on Plus Politics, ahead of the governorship polls, Labour Party reacts to allegations against Lagos State governorship candidate Badebo Rhodes Vivo. And in objection to the presidential election outcome, Atiku leads PDP protest to INEC headquarters. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyam Gul Agadji. The governorship candidate of the Labour Party, LP, in Lagos State, Bade Boros Vivo's election campaign has been energized following last Saturday's presidential election result that saw his presidential candidate, Peter Obi, floor his counterparts in the ruling party of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Bola Tinubu, now president-elect in his home state, Lagos. The 39-year-old governorship hopeful who has stepped up his campaign drive called on Lagosians, especially the youths, not to be deterred by the outcome of Saturday's presidential and national assembly elections, but to come out en masse and vote out the ruling APC in the Guba and state assembly polls. The governorship candidate of the Labour Party, Baribor Rostvaivo, recently reacted to a viral message claiming he is an Igbo man. He has since said he, has, he is an original Lagosian and a true son of his father, a lawyer, Mr. Olawali Rotsvaivo. Joining us to discuss this tonight is um, Shegun Adebanjo, who is the Director General uh, Badebo Rotsvaivo Governorship Campaign of the Labour Party. And he is regard, uh, reacting rather to the allegations ahead of the March 11 polls. Good evening and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. <coughs> Okay, uh, you are the DG of, uh, how would I call it, the reigning Labour Party, right, <laughs> here in Lagos. Your party just got a court order compelling INEC to transmit results electronically and uh, from the polling units in governorship and House of Assembly elections. How does that make you feel now? Does oh, very, we're very excited and pleased about that. We have called for that. In fact, I have gone on record to, um, to be quoted that the... Uh, officials of INEC, I do expect they might be in jail in a couple of years for high treason because what they <coughs> did was that in terms of they betrayed their nation. So we're very pleased with the judgment. Okay. But um, the NBA, um, the chairman of the NBA already has said that he has given INEC like 80% in this election, the conduct of the last election. So does that give you any concern? Because if there's any litigation, it goes to the courts, and the NBA chairman is already applauding the INEC. I think I chose my words <coughs> deliberately when I said high treason. The law itself and INEC com com combined with the INEC guidelines requires that the results be transmitted electronically. And INEC, and a lot of Nigerians had placed their faith on that. And that fundamentally holds our nation together. You put these processes in, in order to have an, a process whereby people can effect peaceful change. If you frustrate that, you give people reason to break the law. So that is, and the system is, I mean, is set up for that. And when they betrayed that, which they did unilaterally, and they have no excuse for it, the law says transmit electronically, and your guidelines make that the law. You cannot unilaterally decide not to and put the whole nation at risk, including whoever wins on a process that's flawed like that, you undermine their own legitimacy. And that's why I said it's high treason for the situation they have put the whole nation currently. But it's quite tricky because the law <laughs> also says that at some point, INEC can use its discretion uh, when they are satisfied that whatever reason they are giving, that the results cannot be transmitted from the polling units, they can just use another, another method to do that. That's in isolated cases, right? That's in isolated cases. You can do that wholesale change in the whole system in which people went. It's almost like even false advertising, if you think about it. They had announced severally, this is what we're going to do. And people had structured their monitoring and confidence on that. And then they change the game after people have acted. Um, that's basically unacceptable. 
But how do you how do you intend to make the people come out again? Because a lot of people have lost lost confidence. Uh, okay, our votes will, will count. That's one of the reasons people trooped out en masse to vote last time. Now it seems it's the same ball game they're playing. How can you get the people back to the polling units? Well, I think it's important that people follow the process because this election, which is closer to them, is actually more important. The only thing that's only required that's going to change the, that they need to change now is exercise more vigilance. And we have put steps in place as well to actually protect the vote and the integrity of the vote this time around. What happened was people anticipated there would be electronic transmission. So there wasn't enough supervision mm. at the collation centers. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the funny business went on. And this time we're ready for that. Do you think there is hope for the Labour Party um, in the presidential election? Because uh, I understand you didn't take it for lying down. You are saying that uh, there's, there's going to be steps that will be taken, legal steps to make sure that if the mandate belongs to the Labour Party, it will be reclaimed. Do you yes. think there is hope for you? Absolutely. I don't think that, um, I mean, I don't think the current announcement by INEC is going to stand. Because if you follow the law, this, this is not a legitimate uh, result. Because, I mean, no one can have confidence in it. The, the, it's not necessarily who the winner is. It's as long as the process is legitimate enough to permit people to accept the outcome. And they haven't done that. Because it's like in any court of law, the fundamental rule is not that you enforce justice, but justice must be seen to have been done. That's the problem with the INEC process here. We don't see them to have um, undertaken a fair and transparent process, and that undermines the entire result, regardless of what the actual outcome is. Okay. But, so you are confident that people will turn out on Saturday for the votes? Absolutely, because it is in their best interest to. Let me explain what's going on here. If you have elected a government in which the process is illegitimate. What do you think the hope for future election, when that person gets into government from a flawed process, that you'd ever get free and fair elections? This is where you have to hold the fort, on the state level, with the government closer to you. And then you have governors who would advocate and fight for a proper process for your votes to count. But do the people know that? That's the education we're doing currently. How much are you at the grassroots? How, how, how rooted are you? Well, you saw the results at the last polls. Was that really because of your grassroots uh, mobilization or the OB factor? Because that's what the people Well, it's say. one and the same thing. I think one thing the old guard of politicians have missed is that they are facing a different type of voter. Mm. Both the way he's communicated to and the fact that, particularly in a place like Lagos, where for some reason most people were surprised with the result. One thing I've come to learn, and which is why um, Badiable is actually, I don't think it's been acknowledged for the courage he has shown to stand up to the climate in Lagos. There's really a climate of fear and intimidation. Mm. So most people wouldn't reveal how discontent they are with the present party. And that's really where our campaign goes in, where we know they've gotten the message. Every, in fact, the APC campaigns for us with their bad record of corruption and fear and intimidation and violence and just the overhang from NSAS to the whole culture that breeds this, what people call the agrarian culture, which is really, I guess, the exploitation of our youth, who should be properly engaged, doing viable, productive things. It's an industry of its own, anyway. You ask but me. think about how that has grown mm. under the 24 years of APC rule. That is a spent force, and the people have come to realize it. They have no new ideas, and that's why they have this negative campaign against Badibo, because they don't want people to, be, to actually focus one, on their bad record, but more importantly, which is actually why I'm here, is the exciting and elegant solution that Badibo has in his manifesto for Lagos. And if you permit me, I'll explain to you. For okay, instance. we'll get to your manifesto, but first of all, let's address this issue of what you just raised about negative campaign. Some people question his loyalty to Lagos. They say he's not legitimately in Lagos. You don't, you don't get to be more Lagos than a Rhodes Vivo. If you know anything about the history of Lagos, where you had one of the first, I believe, it was Supreme Court justices, let me tell you this. The land, the iconic city hall in Lagos was built, belonged to Badibo's family. I think that says enough. That family goes back 400 years. There isn't, more of a, there isn't a more indigenous person, indigenous family to Lagos, is as indigenous as it comes, bottom line. It's not questionable. You can't rebut 
it's, a, it's just not the truth. He's as indigenous as it comes. He's a pure Lagos indigenous, and the records are there to show. Compared to the other, I would challenge even the present governor all the way to Tinubu to give a record of family heritage that compares to that for Badibo in Lagos. Wow, okay. Uh, there's another, another issue. There's a, 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 a video purportedly going around the social media where Badebo's mother uh, said that um, uh, if Lagos wants to develop like the East, they should vote Badebo. Some people find that very insulting. Uh, how do you compare Lagos to the East, the largest economy in Nigeria or even Africa and all that? So what's your response to that? My response to that is this, right? The people who get stuck in traffic for six hours, it's not what Badibo's mother, I'm not, I, I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware of that comment. My point is, all these things are dug up by the AFC as a distraction. I honestly think AFC, it's a by the APC, mm -hmm. and I think it's a responsibility to honestly of the press not to let them get away with this. Why do I say this? Somolu has not even issued a manifesto or any agenda for his program for the four, four years. What is he going to do? He ran away from the debates. And this is the person who wants a job. It's like saying you want a job and you refuse to go for the interview. What are people voting for him on? What are they going to hold him on? What has he said he will do? And that's what I'm saying. And more, furthermore, the primary things that affect Lagosians, he has not addressed. Badibo has a plan, like I said, for instance, to solve traffic. He wants to know, be known as the governor that solves traffic once and for all in Lagos. And it's a simple plan that people should challenge him on and let him show how he's going to pay for it and get it done. He's going to build four rail lines in four years, which is about the same kilometer of rail lines that the federal government built, 169 kilometers, I believe, for the same amount of money that Lagos State used to build 12 kilometers. So, I mean, that's an easy thing. That's fix. been on for like 16 years. So, thank you. He wants and to do it. it. It sounds so Jesus. Like, it's I'll, not, I'll, I'll, I'll break the temple and build it in three days. Thank you. That's because we have, we're used to mediocrity. I mean, other countries, Ethiopia, Egypt, have done it. The thing is, you do all the lines at the same time, not this piecemeal. This government wouldn't do it, not because it can't be done because they are wedded in the current agro system, where they tax Lagosians and trans transporters and build a mafia on top of that, where they collect revenue to fund their politics and recruit thugs to keep them in power. So their vested interest is in not providing Lagosians with good real. Vested, rather than taking all those agbaros and incorporating them into a system where they have better, company, uh, better income and retirement plans for themselves, and their children is into a structure where they're properly trained, and that to be the conductors or the people servicing the rails. That's where that transition to go. You would still have the other transport workers, but they wouldn't have anyone oppressing them and forcing them to do things, which is what is going on now. And we're here to break that. That is in transport. Now, when you solve for transport in Lagos, it opens up the whole economy. You almost triple the economy. So you open mass employment, and you use that to solve things like housing. So housing prices go on, go, I mean, go down because you widen the pool of available land because you've made places like Irkorodu, Ekpe, and um, places, far out places, accessible to people to live in and come to Lagos Island and walk. So that even if you live in Lagos Island, because the supply demand equation is more balanced, your rental prices are reduced. So that's why the transportation thing is such a, is the signature program in his manifesto. And now people should actually hear his security plan. For Before you get to security, okay, that, there are a few things that Lagos, uh, if they can solve, if anybody can solve, yes. will be very interesting. Transportation is one thing, yes. or, or the or traffic jam on the roads yes. is one thing. Uh, you talked about rental you know, problems. Housing. It's, it's, housing problem is a very, very critical one, especially now that the... Um, uh, developers or the, the realtors have taken over. They come here, buy a house, break it, do short let for it and all that. And people can no longer get houses in Lagos. How does he intend to solve the housing problem? Like I told you, he has a, it, his definite plan is threefold. First, he's going to widen the pool of available land and houses to rent. Like I told you, make far out places available. Secondly, within Lagos, for instance, take a place like Lagos Island. It's not a planned development. What should happen there is most of the places that the landlords don't even live there. So they just build these structures. They're poorly managed. I mean, the place has probably given APC his largest votes, like Lagos Island. Their loyalty to APC is not justified. If you go to Lagos Island today, 
the drainage, the habit, I mean, it's not a habitable place. What should happen is the government should pull the landlords together to build higher, more modern structures and contribute to the financing for that. So it's a win-win, including with developers. So what you have is now the landlords would have a number of the floors as theirs, which would be more than they could build on their own. And then the government now has rent control units up and up and up that allows middle income and other people to come in so that the current residents there have the same housing they have at rent control prices, but they're better. You have recreational facilities for children, basketball courts, gardens, and things like that. And that's what his program is going to do for housing. Mm. But tied into that is also things like how he's going to... One thing I want people to probably get excited about is you can have a clean Lagos within six months of this administration, and the program is very simple. That's why his, his plans are very elegant. What he's going to do, he's going to marshal uh, the number of push cart operators that people see all around Lagos, and they're going to be numbered, and they're going to get put on an app, and they would have assigned streets with shovels and things given by the government where they clean the gutters and the streets daily. And that's monitored by the citizens themselves who report on the app if their streets are not properly cleaned, and we won't pay those people. And if you drop by so many stars, we would assign your route to someone else. So it's a self-monitoring system that cleans the whole city within six months and keeps it clean. Furthermore, his security plan, he's going to flood Lagos with police cars, the old checkpoint system where police is stationary. So what happens, you're going to have two, two man police patrol cars. This is the way you see lag ride taxis all over yeah. Lagos. You would flood Lagos with police cars so that the police cars almost every other street so that there's a response unit between two to five minutes for any incident. And together with that, he's going to, so you, you don't have Checkpoint. No, but if you can, if you can get the police cars for the policemen, uh, where will we? Will you get the manpower? For the instance? manpower is there. You have six men stationary. Why don't you just have two men or even one man in a police car? You don't need six of them because what they have six men units to respond in force. You can have six of them respond. That's how it's done in any other country. If you go to the U.S. or anywhere, you see one policeman or his training with a partner, and that's how they police properly the whole city. That you can't properly police the place when you have everyone concentrated in one place. All kinds, it's just inefficient. And even the manpower, the, the tools they carry, we can deal with that. But once you have security mapped out, and you have to invest that money, because once the city is safe, the multiplier effect is in magnitude. Okay. And it's also going to now flood Lagos with solar-powered streetlights that are maintained by young, each company, again, you take young men who are trained, and they would have routes that they maintain those solar power street okay. lights so that even young ladies can feel free to walk the streets safely at night. And that creates a nighttime economy. These are all things that are all linked because okay. it all helps him produce mass employment yeah. uh, for the masses. I'd really like to get to his exciting education plan. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the cardinal points of uh, uh, campaign for APC, especially for the presidential candidate, is that the raised the bar when it comes to economy, that they raised it from a small, uh, a meager amount to about 50 billion in a month and all that. How does he intend to surpass the economic records of the APC government? That's very easy, I just outlined it. If you do just the rail, you can expect the economy of Lagos to quadruple. If you do the safe policing and the night flooding the streets, you'd have a nighttime economy. That's like building a whole layer of an economy into Lagos. And then thirdly, when you do things like the education program and you stimulate the quality of Lagosians in terms of developing skill sets, and in addition to that, you do things like judicial reform. We don't have, we have an operational but not functional judicial system in Lagos. You have a case, it takes two years to resolve a single paragraph in a contract. So what that does is it affects uh, interest rates that banks finance uh, housing development, for instance, and that itself dampens and doesn't stimulate the economy. What he's going to do is going to properly fund the judiciary so that every judge has at least two clerks and a stenographer so that every judgment or every case is resolved within six months. This is going to have severe, some serious multiplier effects that would benefit the economy. And now can I talk about his education plan, because that's very exciting. <laughs> we'll to go me. right ahead for, briefly. Now, his education plan, like most of it, is actually very simple and elegant. What he's going to do is going to roll out 
solar powered, I mean, e learning platform to all schools. So basically, what that does, as you sit at your desk there, you can get classes, you know that, on your laptop that are exactly the same as students in Harvard or uh, Columbia or MIT receive. So it's going to make sure that every child in Lagos gets the, the best quality of education as any child in the US, England, by the same platform. It's going to create a platform in school where students can watch their courses on, on the program, and then the teacher interacts. And that's going to be in so every level school. of education. Are you talking all school, really? all through, from primary schools to secondary school. But the first rollout plan was focused on, uh, I think it's JSS3, where the science, the STEM classes start from, because we want to catch the other students at that level. So you have, and this program is good, you have dynamic uh, presentations of physics and chemistry and things like that, and biology. So that even teachers are trained at the same time and our quality of education improves. And that's radical. So you don't need to send kids abroad to school. You bring London basically to yeah. every school in any community in Nigeria. And I think that's really exciting. In addition to that, he's going to build um, he's going to invest heavily in pre-K education. And the science shows that the best way to develop the mind of a child is between the ages of two and five. And we haven't invested enough in that. So he's going to build what are called like pre-K learning centers. And he will attach them to all over the city, particularly to every market. So what happens is a market woman comes in. She can hand her okay. kids into care and go and focus on okay. selling for the day. It's almost like a daycare for children of market women. That's going to be all over the city. Okay. And the children can watch educational <laughs> okay. programs. And well, learn. I am sure <clears throat> that this manifesto is, is superb. In, in very few words, if you may, uh, let me just know uh, two other things. First of all is, who is this man, Rhodes Vivo? We need to know what makes him qualify for that position because you have given us lofty dreams that he has but to have a dream is one thing to be able to have the capacity to translate those dreams into reality is another thing so what makes you think he qualifies and then a final question so just briefly let's know roots but well the fundamental i mean people i think everyone i think enough people have read about his resume credentials he has gone to the very best schools which only fundamentally validates his intelligence. Now, to be a good leader, you need fundamentally three things. Vision, intelligence, and integrity. And then it depends on where your heart is. Your heart needs to be in a good place, as in for progressive, you have to have empathy for the people, and that drives the direction of your policies. Because in terms of every other skill set, you can source that from the pool in your state uh, to draw for talent. And he has that in a measure of value. But one thing I think he has that people haven't given him credit for is his courage in standing up now to the current power structure in Lagos. And he, all he asks is that people come out one day, one day to stand behind him and vote next Saturday and make that change for the betterment of themselves so they don't leave the next four years in okay. fear and intimidation like has become the culture in Lagos now. OK, uh, well, a final question, like I said. Um, you've an answered that one. If I give you time to talk about Roots 5, I'm sure <laughs> it could take like half a day. But uh, we've heard that, um, or we've not, let me just say we've heard. But this is the time, like, like they say in football, this is uh, injury time. Uh, between now and the day of election, we're expecting that uh, or we were expecting even before the presidential election that there will be alignments and realignments and all that. And we've also heard from another party that there's possibility of you uh, coming together and working as one, especially the PDP uh, has said something like that. So is there any, any hope that you are going to form an alliance with any political party, whether PDP or NRC or whatever other party? I'm glad you brought that question up. Well, the short answer is, this is, I mean, this is a different kind of government that Badibo is trying to lead. He's trying to be governor for all. So whether you join his train now or after he elects victory, there's a rumor going on around like he's going to fire people. His view is that there's so much work to be done, he's not firing, he's hiring. So the idea that civil servants or people who are garbage collectors are going to be fired is nonsense. Mm. He needs more people to build and clean Lagos, not less. Okay. And he's actually going to do better for them. What he's going to do is use his policies to win over even APC supporters. So I would predict within one to two years, APC and other parties may not exist because they've all been converted to the Labour Party because they've now been excited mm. and seen what 
a dynamic government actually looks like? A governor with an evangelism spirit <laughs> That's mm -hmm. how to convert people. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming on this show. I wish we had more time, but this is much we can take. But uh, uh, just for the grace of the period, just say something to uh, the Labour Party fans. Um, no, 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 not, not even Labour Party fans. Lagosians. Who's yes. going to vote? Thank you very much for this opportunity. What I'd like to appeal to Lagosians to understand is, firstly, let me start with even. Um, those who feel dis, uh, disheartened about the results of last election. This election is more important than that election. This is the election that is closest to you and affects you daily. You really need to hold this to heart and come out, in fact, with twice as much passion, because from this foundation is when you can now fight for the, uh, the larger mandate that we thought we got cheated out of. And why I say this is, can you imagine a free and fair election under a bulletin in bullet administration in future? That's probably going to be gone to, be gone to the, I mean, that we won't see that. So this is, the la this is where we need to hold the fort and begin to push back because we don't want to get to that future without this foundation to stand on. And Lagos, I think, is where the battle starts from. And speaking to obedience, once we take Lagos, we will take Rivers, and then we'll take Delta, and then we'll take Kano and Kaduna, and from that, we'll retire the old politicians and the old guy. Now, to APC supporters, this is what I have to ask you, particularly those in places like Lagos Island and Alimosho. You've been loyal to the APC for 24 years, but I live in Lagos Island. I've been to this community. They have not justified that loyalty, and it's time to have a rethink. And to those who they recruit as thugs, what I would ask you is, it's time to turn, flip the switch on them. Take their money, but on that one day, vote for yourself. And don't do their bidding and have a better future for yourself and not just be tools okay. to be used for surgery. Mr. Devanjo, it's, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank uh, you for having me. Good luck to your party and good luck to Lagosians, uh, because the outcome of the election will determine the life that we'll have in the future. And I'm hoping Thank you. that the best man will win. And I implore all of us to visit uh, GRV's website and look at that manifesto. It's something to really get excited about. Okay. All right. Uh, well, well, we'll take a short break. And when we return, we'll be joined by our next guest, who will be talking about what is happening uh, in uh, uh, Abuja. Uh, we will go on this break now, like I said. And when we return, we'll be discussing the PDP protests to INEC headquarters. Stay with us.